Okay, so now that we've seen one example of an algebraic structure, the group, we're ready to move on to consider vector spaces. So a vector space is just another type of algebraic structure. So if you'll recall, an algebraic structure was simply a set, I'll call it V for now, which by itself has little to no structure. All we can know is what elements are in the set or not. But we give the set structure by defining any number of operations on that set. And taking together the set with the operations and the particular list of rules that the operation must satisfy, together that forms an algebraic structure. So now we can define a vector space. A vector space, which I'll call V, that's the underlying set, is the underlying set V taken together with two operations, which I'm going to call vector addition and scalar multiplication. I'll explain exactly what I mean by scalar in a second, but for now, let's focus on the vectors. So the vectors themselves are the elements of this set V. So I'll call a vector little v. And now, what are these two operations? Well, we know an operation is a map. So vector addition is a map that takes two elements from the vector space and maps it to a third element in the vector space. So immediately you can see this will have a closure requirement. The map, the addition of any two vectors in the space returns you a third vector in the space. So we could write this as two vectors V and W say that live in V. They're mapped to a third vector Z which is also in V. So like with any algebraic structure, this vector addition operation has to satisfy a certain set of rules or axioms in order for the set to become a vector space. So the rules are as follows. Commutativity. So if we have any two vectors in the space, their vector addition sum, which I'm going to continue to write in red, commute. So V plus W is the same thing as W plus V. Associativity. This one speaks for itself. Then we have that there exists a so-called neutral, neutral element, or sometimes called identity. They're interchangeable. This means that there exists some particular element, I'm going to call it zero, of the vector space such that zero added to any vector in the space just gives you back the vector. And then finally the inverse, which states that for every vector v in the space, there exists some particular element which I'll call minus v such that v add it to minus v gives you the neutral element zero. So now we realize something. These rules that we've written down that vector addition must satisfy look quite a lot like the group axioms we had before. And notice that closure is implied. So if you remember from the group, we had that there exists an identity element. In this case, we've called it the neutral element, such that when you compose or map or add, they're interchangeable, the neutral element to any vector, you just get back the original vector. And that for every group element, there was also an inverse element, such that when you compose the inverse with an element with its inverse, you are returned to the neutral element. And we see here that we have this commutativity as well. If we remember from the group case, when our composition operation was commutative, we said we had an abelian group. So it turns out that a vector space is simply an abelian group with an additional operation called scalar multiplication, which I'll talk about in a second. But the vector space, just considering vector addition, 
forms an abelian group. Okay, so this is half of what makes a set into a vector space, the fact that we can define a vector addition operation. We also need scalar multiplication. So before I can tell you what scalar multiplication is, I need to tell you what a scalar is. Now, I'm not going to want to go into too much detail about this because it's fairly self-explanatory and it's just going to be laborious to go through the details. But a scalar, I'm going to say, is an element of something which we call a field. Now, a field is just another type of algebraic structure. It's just a set, for our case, I'm going to call it R and it comes with its own addition and multiplication operation. Now I'm going to say, or tell you, that this R is the set of all real numbers. And the set of all real numbers with a addition and multiplication operation, which you should be familiar with, how to add and multiply real numbers, forms an algebraic structure called a field. I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. I'm just going to assume you kind of have a good feeling for what real numbers are and you know how to add and multiply. So we could also have used other fields. Other fields exist like the set of complex numbers or any other crazy field you can think of. We're just going to stick with the real numbers. And in everything that follows, we're going to be considering real vector spaces. So what do we mean by this and why do we need a field? Well, we need a field in order to define the scalar multiplication operation. So scalar multiplication, this dot operation, is a map that takes an element from the field and an element from the vector space and returns you an th element in the vector space. So if I call the field element lambda, then you take some lambda, a scalar, from the field, some vector from the vector space, and you're given a another vector in the vector space. OK, so like with the vector addition, our scalar multiplication must satisfy a list of rules or the axioms. And they are associativity, in that if we have two scalars, say, gamma and lambda, oops, So if we first scalar multiply a vector and then scalar multiply the resulting vector, the result is the same as multiplying the two scalars together and then acting on the original vector. Notice I was careful to use the red blob when we're talking about scalar multiplication acting on a vector. This whole thing here is some vector. But here, where I'm multiplying two scalars together, I've used this regular black multiplication. Being very careful about that now, probably going to drop that later. So then we have distributivity. So if we begin with two scalars again, and we add them using regular addition on real numbers, then we take that resulting number and act on a vector with scalar multiplication. It's the same thing as doing the scalar multiplication on individual vectors and then adding them, oops, vector adding them. And then equivalently, we have another distributivity law, which says that if we have any scalar, and we scalar multiply uh, a vector addition. So if we have v vector plus w, we can again split this up as we would expect. And then finally, we have that there exists an identity, an identity scalar which I'll call i, such that when you scale and multiply i with any vector, you are just returned that vector.
So these are the rules that scalar multiplication must follow, and then taken with the rules that vector addition must follow, any set that you can show satisfies both of these rules for all its elements forms a vector space. Okay, so as these as we've set these rules out here, we've been completely abstract. We've not said anything about what V and W actually are. We're just showing how they must combine or compose under addition and scalar multiplication such that the whole, the whole set of elements forms the algebraic structure known as a vector space. You might be wondering, well, where are the, the vectors that I'm familiar with? This kind of thing. We'll see that objects like this are just one of the many sets of objects which have the underlying structure of a vector space. So like with the groups case, any set that you can find and show me that all of its elements uh, under these two operations satisfy all of these rules, then that is a vector space. You found a vector space.